The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. The Radio Memories Network welcomes you to the world of modern radio theater, an old medium revived for a new era through the Radio Memories Network. From the four corners of this world, there are more than 341 million people who speak English. This is the society of the ear, the society of the mind. Our voices are legion. Here we have the opportunity to spread stories through the theater of the mind all across the cyber byways and radial beacons. We are inclusive. We are eclectic. We are collective. We are the Sonic Society. Welcome to another meeting of the Sonic Society. I'm your host, Jack Ward. Each week we delve into the suspenseful and the sublime, the action-packed and the erudite. We look into masterpieces of audio cinema and some of the mayhem behind the sonic scenery. Membership is inclusive. You already have the best seat in the house. The Soul Patrol is back on duty this week in the Sonic Society. David Konigsberg's Fantasy Morality Tale series continues with Episode 3 and 4. After the feature, we'll continue our conversation with Mr. Konigsberg and listen to the weekly serial from Dream Realm Enterprises with Robots of the Company, episode number five. But without further ado, let's raise ourselves on high with episode number three of the Soul Patrol, here on the Sonic Society. What a miserable week. We took in how much? This much. Oh. Don't move or I'll kill you. Please. Kennedy and Hazel O'Connor, starring in Tonight's episode, Worthless. Pretty good for a single night. It took us a week. You try to follow me or call the cops, my homeboys will come back to finish you off. Oh, come on. You can't be serious. We can't let him get away with this. He'll kill us. We'll follow him in the spirit form. Uh, but, but what? He's got our entire growth for the week to ruin us. We have to get it back. I still don't think that it's the one who keeps on wanting to take on these individual cases. 
Here's one screaming out for attention. Someone's going to take care of him someday. All right. But I'm not going to be the one to tell the accounting general that we did nothing to recover the money. Hmm. Well, I have no idea of who this accounting general is, but I have a feeling that meeting with this person is not an entirely pleasant experience. You're going to love your daily audits with General Wumpwacker. <sighs> All right. Let's serve some justice. <laughs> I'm still in charge. Mum. Yes, Mum. I think we can still catch him. Come on, we have to fly up. Oh. I hate this. <laughs> there. There he is. Where? Two o'clock at the bus stop. Bus stop? Times must be tougher than I thought. We would get a low rent, Crook. Let's move in closer. What's he doing? It looks like he's waiting for someone. Can you do a mind read from here? Mm, just barely. Ha! He's waiting for a ride. His accomplice is either really dumb or really smart. When I find out this guy's case officer, boy, am I going to give them a piece of my mind. We could have gotten killed. Holler. Oh, you going to get yours, creep. You don't know who you've been messing with. Holly. What we're gonna do with you. Holly. Request permission to blow this jerk right away, ma'am. Request denied. Oh, come on. One good accident and this guy's fried. No. A stray bus, a bolt of lightning. One fell swoop, we get him and the money. You heard me. <sighs> and people wonder why the world is going to hell. Holly. I'm all in favor of giving this bloke our special attention. But let's make it special. The minute we get to know him, you go easy on him. No fire and brimstone from you. All right, I'll make you a deal. A fiery death versus whatever I come up with. But only after an investigation. You choose. Really? Really. Deal. Get the marshmallows ready. The things I put up with. Now begins the hard part. You've got that right. One thing. Yeah? I hope he's at least been waiting for a girl. There's hope for you yet, St Kilda. He was a Latino male. Five foot six, 129 pounds, 24 years old, a little too old for being in a gang and acting solo. With heavy set eyes and a face that said, I'm stupid, ignorant, and therefore think I'm innocent, the patrol found him cute, nevertheless. Care to do a reading, Billy? Only if you join me. Who's watching me? Go ahead. Look all around the bus. He won't find us. I'm never going to let this happen again. What are you getting, Billy? Uh, his name is Raymond, but he's known as um, Ray or Raymondo. Subject was aware that he had perpetrated a crime, and he feels um, light guilt from his actions. Subject is also in moderate pain. From drug withdrawal, internal condition suggests heroin with an abuse of doctor described tranquilize, as well as the over-the-counter narcotics. Raimundo, you still owe me for two hits and four scores ago. Well, looky here. Where are some of those higher quality bills? This is what I've got. Hey, couldn't you? You still owe me. His state of mind suggests that his crime was not induced by the direct effect of drugs, but of his own free will.
Living conditions indicate. Wow, look at all this stuff. And so, while Billy and Holly looked through his possessions, Raymond prepared to shoot up the heroine. A model of the bus from the Double Deckers. I love that show. Why haven't you done anything more? What's taking up all this? Del Mundo, it's me. Oh shit, it's her. I was late with the car, honey. Yeah. Did we have a tough evening? Oh, what is this? And I thought we were transparent. You know, honey, I really missed you. I really did. I thought about you all day. I love you, baby. Oh, a happy couple. Shh. Yeah, sure. What do you have there, lover? Well, what does it look like to you? Honey, if you really loved me... All right. Honey, could I go first? Sure. Love is letting her shoot up first. I think I'm going to be sick. <sighs> you are going to clean the... <sighs> well, no, I guess not. As Raymond now laid on his back, he looked up at the ceiling and enjoyed one of his favorite illusions. For the ceiling had a cottage cheese-like texture and it would now begin to slowly churn with time. And on it, reflections of the headlights outside would repeat their pattern on those churns again and again and again until they weren't headlights at all, but colors, comets of interstellar dust with their own movement, independent of any order. Oh, yeah. yeah. Raymond began his slow, assured ascent to the ceiling itself and then through it. Uh... Is he gone or I think he's gone? Yes, but not permanently. I always wondered about this. Hey, Raimundo, back again. It's more beautiful than ever before. How did you find me? We saw you in your brother's trip, which may be an offense. Hey, I know my rights. Hey, we're here to help. My brother? Orale pues. I'd do anything for my little brother. But what can you do? We're with the Soul Patrol. That don't mean nothing to me. Your brother is in danger of killing himself through drug abuse and criminal activity. We may have to take action against him. We wanted to find out more about his situation. I also thought that it might help if you tried to reach him first, you know, like, tried to set him on the right track. No way, ma'am. Why? Is it because we might punish him? No, ma'am, that's not it. Well, then why not? I mean, he's your brother, and you said you'd do anything for him. You weirdos, you just don't get it, do you? No, we don't. So why don't you just explain it to us? Well, see, it's like this. My little brother, he looked up to me. I can't tell him what to do or what not to do. That's not my thing. So how'd you get up here? 
How do you think, ma'am? I flew. She means, how did you die? Whoa, I don't even know. It might have been the drugs or the car or the gang. I was really living every night. Bang, bang, bang. And so now, how do you like things up here? It's like hell, ma'am. I know how they say it's heaven, but for me, it's hell. I can't do nothing but remember. Kind of painful, isn't it? You said it. I kind of blew it, ma'am. I really blew it. I didn't know what I had. So let's get this straight. Your brother is down there right now, living pretty much the same life you led, which you seem now to regret, and even though you might be regularly visiting him, you don't want to help him? Look, I already told you. Your file says you died of an overdose. Did you know that your brother stands more than a 50-50 chance of dying the same way? That's his problem. He got to live his own life. Well, you're right about that. But where, just where, did little Raimundo pick up these little habits? Hey, that wasn't me. Well, no, you said it yourself. You said that he looked up to you. What kind of example do you think you set? I don't know. I was kind of high at the time. Well, you're high now. Just how does it feel? <laughs> Do you think that he's going to come around? They always do. I don't know why I let them get to me. Maybe it's the uniform. Look at him. He's been made an angel. That's something that'll never happen to me or you. Still wet behind the wings and already on his first save. I don't believe it. What? That? That's the gun he's been using. That junk is joke. It don't work. We found it in the junkyard one day. Then I found it there after the jam. We got robbed with a phony. It's fine with me. We went through all that for nothing. Okay. You're lucky, white girl. There's a lot worse out there on the street. Great. But listen, this gun's a beauty. Check out that handle. That handle. What do you mean, where was I? I was out with some friends, and where were you? Making plans. I wish. Ray, I keep telling you, you've got to stop living in a dream world. It's time to get real. This is real. Look at this hammer. Look at the handle, the detail. Ray, Earth to Ray, we're not going to get anywhere like this. Hector just bought Martina a new XZ. Don't you want to have money like that? I thought you didn't know his name. Quick, tag mind read. He suspects that she's been sleeping with everyone. And he's right. Really? Let me see. <gasps> yeah? Evil snatch. Ray, you know I love you. I missed you all day. You're the only one I ever think of. Bitch. Don't fail me, Tiger. Mmm. It is a big gun. Uh, I'll think about it. No, you'll do it. It's just a small bank. Why don't you check your machine? Maybe we could just stay here tonight. Steady, Angel. 10, 20, 30, No, there's nothing. No, not yet. It's too early. Help me with my top, would you? Any messages? I told you, no. Shit, Esmeralda was supposed to call me. Wait! I gotta go, Ray. She needs me. But... And Ray, no one cares how pretty your gun is. That's it. What's he gonna do when he discovers that his... our money is missing? Yeah. Like when he's push it, just kill him? If he doesn't pay? Would you like to make a withdrawal, sir? Uh, with, uh, no, no. I must have grabbed the wrong slip. Excuse me. Not at all. Next? Oh, no. What have I done? We're open to suggestion. Believe it or not, 
There may be a way out of this. First, in order to immediately diffuse the situation, I had Angel mentally suggest to his brother that now was not the right time to rob the bank. Toby the 13th. Seen any black cattle lately? Maybe I shouldn't do it right now. And that Bianca was right. Maybe he needed to get a better gun. She's been right in the past. Better safe than sorry. Feeling lucky today, punk. Hmm, maybe I should get a bigger gun. I then explained my plan to both Holly and Angel. Angel hated my plan he suddenly, until he heard Holly's option. burst into a ball of fire death. What? You muchachos go too far. Why must everything be fire and brimstone for you? Against Angel's wishes, I still gave Holly the choice of punishments. Mine or hers. Sorry, Angel. I still want a severe punishment. Just then, we received a communique from the Heavenly Order. It was in response to Holly's question of who, in the Order, was the case officer originally responsible for Raymond. You've asked for some news of who failed their dues. We've got some bad news. The answer is you, Holly Violet. What? Me? Can I have my tip now? What? I couldn't tell which got the worst reaction. At any rate, the communique had nothing to do with the Lieutenant Violet's decision to choose my plan. We contacted the Department of Lost and Found and received prompt, courteous service. Come in! I hope you guys know what you want, because i got to be back at the pork and pay within an hour. All right, you got your Glocks, your automatics, your use the semis, police specials, SWAT force, armed forces, etc. What are you looking for? Look, don't waste my time. I go through enough of this at work. Let's get this over with. It took only a short time for us to come to a consensus. With some guidance from Angel. Raymond was able to find our planted object. Oh, wow, what a find. This revolver's the beauty. Ah, where'd I put that old gun? And, as agreed upon with the department, the subject lost a similar object forever. You know, maybe this is worth something. Maybe. Stop living in a dream world. We're not going to get anywhere like this. Earth to Ray, Earth to Ray. Don't fail me, Tiger. This was his last chance out. Oh, shit. I gotta go through with it. Okay, let's do it. Wait a minute, did I remember to? Go do it. You know her, man. You know her, the bullets. You did not forget. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, Raymundo. Don't blow it now. Get in, get out, get in, get out. All right, this is a stick up. Give me all your. Your. detail. They don't make them like this anymore. What is that, hand tool? It does seem that way. Seems intentional. Now, do you understand your rights as I read them to you? Yeah, I guess so. 
Excuse me, Patterson, but a little question for our friend here. Where'd you find that gun? I don't know, man. Well, you're in the wrong business, son. That gun's a single-action 1911 Colt revolver. They only made a hundred of them, and yours looks like it's in mint condition. It's worth over a hundred thousand dollars. But you did one thing smart. You left the bullets out. You would have blown your head off. It's a shame it's gonna have to be melted down. Let's go. I've really blown it. Raymond? Bianca? Hector? She's got her arms around him. And why bother to remove them? I've traded up. You. I know I want to see you again. Hey, get into the patrol car. Nothing. It's up to you and the Angel Corp now. Our jurisdiction is completed. There goes our money. Oh, gee. I almost forgot. They gave this to me last time I was upstairs. We can't eat this. I forgot. Okay. Henry, the you two lockers are all some weak clothes from some guy. Some kind of counting mistake. A general warmth wecker? Yeah, that guy. Ah. Um... All right, little Miss Mary Sunshine. What about Raymond's girlfriend? Ha! I knew it. Some corner left undone. Holly? A thread unstitched. Holly? A road which goes nowhere. Holly, don't be know. You're her case officer. Ah. Oh. You will have an interesting way of working. <laughs> Episode starred Joe Kennedy as Billy St. Kilda. Hazel O'Connor as Holly Violet. Reynaldo Rivera as Raymond and Angel. Pamela Mendez as Bianca. And with... Ariel Cancino as the fast food employee and the policewoman. Don Guido as the deputy sheriff. Quinn Kitmidolajoka as dispatcher and patrolwoman. Kristen McGuire as the bank teller. And Peter Beckman was your narrator. Tatiana Swan was the casting director and production assistant. Alex King was the associate producer. Music was composed by Franz Liszt and was adapted and sequenced by John C. Graves. The production was recorded and mixed at Command Post. This series and this story was created, produced, and copyrighted 1999 by David Konigsberg. This work cannot be posted, broadcast, or transferred in part or in whole without the express written permission of David Konigsberg. This has been a Cosmic Forces presentation, darling. You're listening to the Sonic Society, and I'm Jack Ward. Episode number four of the Soul Patrol begins in a moment. Hello? Anybody there? You know we are. Who are you? We've always been there. Listening. Who are you? What do you want? You've heard of the Society. The Society? The Sonic Society. I know you know. This is crazy. I I'm gonna hang up. We'll be here, Andrew. We never really left. No one makes radio plays anymore. We do. Our numbers are legion. We're growing every day. And we're waiting.
waiting for you. For me? We're waiting for you to join us, Andrew. Join you? But, but why? Because radio drama lives. <laughs> We now return to David Koenigsberg's The Soul Patrol, here on the Sonic Society. Oh, yeah? Well, our boss is God. God's a dog catcher, and I'm his personal slave. He makes my job all politics. Everything is political. Oh, nothing is political, and good night, America. And he pinches my ass every day. Sounds like someone will meet one day. Well, God took her out of the candy shop in Melbourne and put her in charge of all human souls in the world. Wow, now that's a job ship. Uh, this just came in from upstairs. I didn't know there was a second floor. There isn't. It's just a figure of speech. What's with you two? The way you're looking at it, you'd think it was poison. No, it's not the drink, it's the message. Huh? Why don't you go ahead and read it, Billy? To Billy St. Kilda, Soul Patrol, from the High Commissioner of the Planet Earth, December 15th. Hmm. It's two weeks late. R.E., your command. Recently it has come to my attention that... Mine just has some jokes on it. And so, because of the failure to reach this quota, you are full... Forthwith informed and duly notified that you will be relieved of your command. Happy New Year. I've been sacked! Joe Kennedy and Hazel O'Connor starring in Tonight's episode, Happy New Year. When I just started at this job, I was just starting to get the hang of it. I thought I was doing good. Maybe I could get you a job in town. Oh, thank you, darling. But I don't know, I just don't think I'm ready to go to the dogs. Here, let me see that thing. I understand. I never wanted to work at the pound myself. Hmm. I've got an in at the Department of Sanitation. Oh. Okay, I've got the idea. I'll be back. You know, there may be a way out of this. There is? See here, the only reason you're going to be dismissed is because you're short of a quota. Quota? What quota? Which quota? Why don't we go into the office? That's just the way things are with the heavenly order. But all this says is that you were once short by just one case for the last quarter. So all you need to do is to start one before the end of the year and make sure that it can be applied to the right quota. Oh yeah, great. In just four minutes. 
Well, then why not just start a case and then later file an amendment to make it fit whatever quota you need? You mean I have a chance? I'd say you have a strong mandate from upstairs to work a little faster. Oh, no. Not so fast. It still has to be successful. But thank you, Holly. Let's go. Hey, how about Darlene's boss, the arse pincher? Oh, but there's not enough of a case there. All right, then someone else. But we've got only three minutes to do it in. Well, let's find them now. <laughs> no, probably not right. <laughs> Drunk, disorderly, and who cares? Oh, she's been through hell. Whoop, there it goes. Yes! Fat and stupid and not worth it. They know their problem. Oh, Boring. Find anything? No. It's been a pleasure working. Oh, oh wait a minute. The Queen of Angels maternity ward, waiting for that local couple who will have the first birth of the year. And with only seconds to go, it's still anyone's guess on exactly which lucky couple that will be. There are several patients in labor at this very moment. I'll be right back with that first birth of the year. Ew, now, switch it back to seven. Oh, wait, stop. Don't change it. Oh, that's our case. What is that woman on television? She was lying through her teeth. How would you know? We can't tell that over a TV. Look, almost everything through that thing is a lie. But that woman, she's been lying a lot and she doesn't like it. Look, you can see it on her face. Get out your crystal ball and file the case. You could tell all that from just a few seconds. Well, that's all I had. Is it in? They received it in time. I transmitted it right before midnight. How did you classify it? 7135.809 Germanistic Line. Huh? And here she is, the firstborn of the year here at Queen of Angels Hospital. Let's talk with the proud Oh, nice. I could be happy right now. This is the best way to start the Well, what do you think? And how is the mother? You're going to love the dog pound. I think I've got something here. I hope I've got something here. What? I'm not exactly sure. Holly? Mum? Yes, Mum? We've got to get over to that hospital. To find her, trail her, and get her in her sleep? You got it! than an HMO. Wait a minute, I'm there. Yes, she finally found them. For over in the corner was a newborn baby, but not the one reported in the story. This new baby boy had started his life in an incubator. At his side was his mother. She lovingly gazed up at the ceiling, trying to gather whatever strength she could muster. For at this moment, she had only one goal in life. To get back on the street, do a trick. And yes, if you must know, they were African American. A male nurse has been dispatched to temporarily break up this happy family. We'll have to move you to another room in just a minute. Well, I can see you're torn. Hey, let's read him. He might know something. Roger. Where's the firstborn of the year? Right here. Bingo! You've got a case. What's the matter with the firstborn? He was born two months premature and is dangerously underweight. It's going to be touch and go. And is that because of his mother? Yes, she's a crack addict. Her mind. Oh, I don't want to read. Sir, I get the feeling that you're trying to hold back anger. Yeah, 
She's probably going to abandon him the same way I was. Yo, this is getting worse. Did that TV reporter know which baby was the firstborn? Sure, we all did. Billy? Yes, Holly? We've heard enough. Agreed, but we've got to confirm with Matula. We'll get her in her sleep. the truth. I'm always the willing accomplice. All right, that's enough. She's confirmed everything. Satisfied? No. No, no, I'm not. There's still one idea that I, I just don't get. Matula, why? Why did you do it? Mm. Careful, Billy. You might wake her. It's sometimes harder to get the truth. Yeah, I know, but I've got to find out. I mean, these lies, like, they just hurt everyone, especially that little baby. Why did you do it, Mathula? Why did you break your professional oath? Why are you lying? Why? Everyone else is. I don't care about everyone else. Why are you doing it? Hmm. Yes. Yes. Because. Because it's a bad story. It's a bad example. It makes us, us blacks look bad. We must, we must give positive role models. We must. But at what price? At any price. Satisfied now? Yeah, I'm satisfied. All right. For once, we're going to do things your way. We are. Lieutenant Milo? Mom, yes, Mom. The one action we need to take is to immediately help save that little boy's life. Now, what do we have that we could give him? Let me check my crystal ball. How about some calm? Calm. <laughs> Excellent. Now, how can we service the target? Oh, we've got it in liquid, crystal, powder, tablet, mint. It doesn't matter. So long as it gets there. Now, how much can we deliver? As much as you want, Mum. An infinite supply is at our disposal. Fine. Arrange it so that we stuff this kid with so much good karma that he'll never hit a don't walk sign in his life. Mum. What is it? You got a locker? No, Mum. It's the heavenly order. They're denying our request. It appears. Uh oh. What do you mean by uh oh? That baby. That little black baby. He's serving out some kind of sentence. He's got a prior conviction. He's just been born and already he's considered guilty? Aren't all black people? No. Now, wait a minute. If we're not allowed to help this baby, then there's no victim. And if there's no victim, then you've got no case. I've got the tickets. I tell you, Billy, it was the only way. Oh, don't be silly. I don't mind time travelling. I'm Australian. Speaking of which, what are we going to do about our accents? Hmm. How's this? Well, I do declare. We better stick with our own accents. Oh, it's easy for you to say. My country hasn't developed its accent yet. It serves you right for choosing to be born in a country full of. Shh, shh, shh. Here they are. Separated families in Africa. Let's watch from here. Why isn't he preaching in the church? Because he wasn't invited. We must fight for the Confederacy. What? What was he, what was he talking about? Huh? Well, I think we can see why he got convicted. I think we can go now. No, no, no. Let's hear him out. If it should come to war, so be it. But the South must prevail. We will get no freedom from the North. You have my word on that. Good people. Come on, Bessie. I don't want you hearing no Uncle Tom. I agree. Surely you must know that Mr. Lincoln has said 
He has no interest in freeing slaves. His only concern is to save the Union, which must not come to pass. It will only be a paper freedom. It cannot be given. You never attain freedom unless you fight for it. And how would you know, sir? I was a slave, and I fought for my freedom. I escaped. And why aren't you dead yet? It will happen, either in the North or the South. It makes no difference. As a slave, I felt. <laughs> well, you good people already know about that, don't you? But even if freedom would have been given, I know that I would never have been truly free. For something given can always be taken away. Maybe not with a single blow, but bit by bit are different chunks at different times. It must be beyond that possibility. Why is this making sense to me? A nation is no different. In a hundred years' time, we will be no different. We will still be slaves with no power, no homes, and no family. And it will be as much their fault as it is our own. Mr. Washington. Yes, Pastor. Are you saying that we must kill in order to be free? What kind of freedom is there in that? That's a good question. Pastor right. No. If you can, you can always refuse to take part. And if you can't, as we are now here, then you can become the white man's drug. A confederacy will become drunk on our labor, an opiate. They will need more and more of us to do their bidding. Soon, they will not be able to do a thing without us. But alas, by then we will far outnumber them, much more than now. For an opiate consumes a body until it is too late for the body to rid itself of it. And when that time comes, the South, which we have built, will become our own. But you're asking us to remain slaves. That's too high a price. If we're given freedom, the price will get higher every day. Confirm it. Let's see how he's doing. So who was responsible for this? The Department of Love and Peace? The Bureau of Happiness Management? Or maybe it was just a bunch of the guys in their spare time. I actually found out. What? It was the Soul Patrol. What? In the 1800s. Oh. The previous members of the patrol thought it was, and I quote, a suitable and just punishment. Wait a minute. The rest is in my crystal ball. For a man wanting others to believe that enslavement would eventually bring them freedom. How correct. Sounds like a case would run up today. In a rush. I could check that. Ah. Oh. So how is my mandate? <laughs> You mean like good luck? It can be good or bad, but we need some, a lot actually, and soon. All I got is a bunch of dogs, and they can't have any good luck, otherwise they wouldn't have ended up in the pound. <coughs> I know you got something. What is it? It sounds like... Every dog on the planet has some karma. You just have to find one that has a lot and know how to get it out. Oh, look at this little cute guy.
And I thought being assigned to a bowling alley was bad. Still, I wouldn't trade my job for anything in the world, for the few that I can save. Ah, oh, me too. Include me. But Holly, would you still like to pass judgment on Darlene's boss here? I said I liked my job, not yours. Well, there. How about that one? Uh, he looks nice, but does he have a lot of luck? Yeah, bad and good. He got in, and now he's getting out. <coughs> Can we keep him? Well, let's see how he works out first. What are we going to call him? Here, Karma. Good boy. Back this way, boy. Hey, Holly, how much longer do we have to keep doing this? Here, Karma. Good boy. The more Karma passes by him, the more good luck he'll have. Karma! Everyone knows and approves of wanting happy stories, wanting positive role models, without bad examples, at any price. And since everyone else is doing it, we just thought that we might share with you our idea of a happy story with a positive role model. But there's one point that you may not like. It, it happens, happens to be true. baby going to be up for adoption? For you? Yes. But why? I had a dream, but now I want to make it real. Congratulations, Billy. Oh, thanks, you. What's it say? Excuse me. I should have said congratulations, boss. Starred Joe Kennedy as Billy St. Kilda, Hazel O'Connor as Holly Violet, Skip Hopkins as the nurse, Raphael J. Noble as Lester R. Washington, Muriel Whitaker as Mathula Wantanawanabe, and with Jonathan Grow, a voice, Eric Burr as Chuck, Kurt Hardy as the pastor, Susan Hart as Darlene, Keith Holloman, a voice in the crowd and a slave, Lawrence Hubbard as the husband and another voice in the crowd, Tracy Puri Conishburg as Bessie, Harry Saban as the bartender. And Peter Beckman was your narrator. Tatiana Swan was the production assistant. Alex King was the casting director and associate producer. Music was composed by Franz Liszt and was adapted and sequenced by John C. Graves. The production was recorded and mixed at Command Post. This series and this story was created, produced, and copyrighted 2000 by David Koenigsberg. This work cannot be posted, broadcast, or transferred in part or in whole without the expressed written permission of David Koenigsberg.
This has been a Cosmic Forces presentation, darling. The Sonic Society will return in a moment with an interview with writer, producer, and creator of the Soul Patrol, David Konigsberg. <laughs> The invasion fleet stood on full alert. Admiral Thurlock paced the bridge of his flagship, eye stalks trembling with fury. The door dilated, and Chief Knowledgeist Grimble entered nervously. Is it true? the Admiral growled. Have the Earthlings destroyed themselves before we could get to them? Ah, uh, no, sir, said Chief Grimble. All radio emissions from the Earth did go silent, but it's not because they destroyed themselves. Quite the opposite. He held up a small rectangle of white plastic. They've been hurling these into space in place of radio waves. It's called an iPod shuffle. Great gods, said the Admiral. Could they have advanced so quickly? They have, sir. We've been analyzing the contents. We've learned that Earth's media dictatorship has fallen, replaced by a free republic of so-called podcasts. Everyone has total free expression, and all their music can be played without a license. They all gather in an alley to elect their leaders. Currently the benevolent Queen Dawn and King Drew in the capital city of Coverville. But how? the Admiral demanded. Where did they get such ideas? Well, sir, you're not going to like this part. Although they're free, they all bow to a supreme overlord, Adam Curry. Curry has conquered another planet? the Admiral roared. Damn that galactic rock and roll geek. This is the bitterest pill indeed. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, what shall we do, sir? Do? Well, we can't fight them. We'll have to create a podcast of our own and corrupt their regime from within. Get me a computer, a microphone, the cheapest mixer you can find. We will show them that we, too, have audacity. Ah, uh, yes, sir, said Grimble, backing away slowly. This wasn't going to go well. He wondered if there was time to jump ship. The Weiner Rebellion was still going on in the asteroid belt. Surely they had need for an evil genius. And prepare the Votatron! Escape Pod, the science fiction podcast magazine. Find us at escape.extraneous.org. Welcome back to the Sonic Society. We now continue with part two of our interview with Mr. David Konigsberg. Uh, that would be exciting, um, especially to be able to see uh, the Soul Patrol on television after listening to it in the radio drama and be able to s compare the way the stories go. Like, what kind of things, if you've written them for television originally, what kind of things are different that you had to conceive of writing it for radio than when you did for writing it as a telescript? Some things have been very easy and some things have been very hard. Uh, with TV, you can communicate so much visually and just a single shot and it explains everything. And then on radio, you gotta somehow have characters or a narrator talk about it to give you the same idea. And what I've had to do is throw that all out and say, reimagine it for radio and say, well, you can't take a TV script and write it for radio. You really can't. You have to stop and think first. Well, I was gonna show this, this, and that to convey that, that, and this. That's all gone now. Now how do I do it in radio? And so huge chunks of the TV went just right out the door. Uh, and it wasn't, but you, you, you have to stop and you have to reconsider the entire uh, script. And so in some cases, I've ended up liking the radio version better. I never thought I would feel that way, but I go, wow, this really works great. Or, uh, man, I never considered that before. And it's forced me, you know, and I'm talking to some television networks here in uh, Hollywood. It's worse me. I've had to tell people here, yeah, yeah, this was what I wrote, but you know what? I want to make some changes to the script if we do the series because the radio version has changed my mind about certain things. So there's some histori history behind that, too, though, because uh, a lot of people don't realize how many of the early television shows came from radio and my favorite example is not Dragnet or Gunsmoke, which everyone points to. Right. My favorite, favorite example is Green Acres, it where, wasn't... Um, uh, how that transition occurred from taking the radio show and making it into TV. 
it helped tremendously that it was a radio show first, um, and I could see the problems they would have had if it hadn't been. Burns and Allen. Yeah. Burns right. Allen. Right. No, I, it's exactly. I that's I had forgotten that Green Acres was on radio, but it was. So I guess my next question is: So what has been the most challenging aspect for you doing radio drama, and what's the most rewarding? Well, I'm not really doing radio drama. You know, we don't really have terms for this um, in this world, but it should be that radio drama is done live or recorded in one take with all actors in front of a microphone at the same time with a sound effects guy. I guess what I'm really doing is audio theater because uh, although we would record most of the dialogue in a single afternoon, almost every episode was a single afternoon, uh, I spend weeks editing and pruning and touching up and sweetening Mm -hmm. and moving things around to get it perfect. Why am I doing that? Because I can. Why I like (laughs) doing that? No. <laughs> I am with you 100%. That's my job. Andrew's nodding his head off his shoulders there. So. Yeah, uh, that's, that is, uh, it's, we, we like to call it audio cinema because we are painting a auditory picture. A semitone makes all the difference between a scene being comical and a scene being terrifying. Right, right. And uh, that's why I ultimately do enjoy, you know, that final mix, I go, wow, it sounded like hell when I started, and now it's this other complete thing, which I I do enjoy later on, but not, not while I'm sweating in front of that computer screen for, like, weeks on end. So after you've gotten all this stuff out there, how difficult has it been to get it out in the local stations? Oh, um, I'll tell you in one word, impossible. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I, I, I came in, I started finishing up these episodes in, um, late 1999, and, um, I actually am finishing another episode soon, but they were mostly done in 99, 2000, and 2001, and I'm coming out with episode eight probably, uh, later on this year, and I've got all the rest to edit, but when I came out with this stuff and tried to, uh, get it on the air, Radio drama was dying and dying and dead here in the United States. And uh, NPR was ending its radio playhouse. It had run for like 20 years or something. Oh, you're kidding. And uh, the month I applied, they decided to kill it. Oh, no. (laughs) I really hated that timing. Um, That's terrible. And then when I tried to get it on some of our local stations or other stations across the U.S., uh, none of them wanted my show, and all of them were, like, trying to kill off uh, this monster that was taking up a half hour or more on the, each of their stations. They were all trying to cut back on radio drama because the field has been, lamentably, kind of dead and uh, not relevant, which is what I hope to change with my show. So... Do you think the internet has influenced audio cinema now? Do you think it's it's helped sort of spark life into it again now that we've got podcasting? Yes, I think it's going to have a tremendous effect. It has had a really good effect. I would never have done this radio drama if it were not for the internet because in the back of my head, I always had this fear that if I take this time and I try to make this thing into a series, because one episode ain't going to do it. One of the great things about, you know, TV and radio and serials is that it's just not one show. It's a whole bunch of shows. But if I do this, I spend all this time and money, who says it's ever going to get on the air? And I was proven correct. I could not get it on the air back then. This is the world premiere of the series. You've got it. This is the broadcast premiere. We're very excited. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, if it weren't for the internet, I would never have done it. Well, I was glad to be able to find you, and I started listening to what you had on your website. Could you give everybody what your website is? Oh, you mean the uh, URL? That's right, if you could. Well, I'll give you the hard way, and then I'll give you the easy way. Okay. The hard way is to type in www.the-soul-patrol.com. 
dot com. And when I say dash, I guess I mean hyphens is right. the official word. Yeah. But if you type into any search engine, the Soul Patrol radio drama, you'll find it. It'll just be like the first, second, or third hit. Yeah, I found that it was the first one in most search engines that I looked up. Yeah, it should be right up there. And I want to point out there's some really neat stuff on your website talking about many of the things that we talked about here, the process, some of the shows that you took in, you know, influence from. You mentioned Dragnet. You, know, you mentioned some of the other shows that are there. It was, it was really interesting reading for me to be able to go there, and I highly recommend to anyone else to get a chance to go to your website, listen to up-and-coming shows that you are working on, and some of the teasers. It's great. Oh, great, yes. That would be wonderful. And that's one of the things I should point out about podcasting is, and it's the one bad thing about podcasting, is it does seem to discourage website visits. Because with a podcast, there's no need to go to the website more than once. So that would be my warning. And I think a lot of people in radio drama and audio theater are catching on to that problem. That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that, and that's something that's uh, we'd have to work around because it's it's good to be able to go to the website and see not just the new the new story that you have there, but some of the news that crops up about where people can find this stuff. Well, it's just uh, it depends. There's a there's a whole problem with advertising and the business model for making radio drama work. And if you can put ads in your podcast, great. That's fine. But if you can't and you have advertising on your site, which I've never had to do and I, I don't intend to, but if you want to put ads on a site, then you got to get people to go to your site. So that is one of the challenges of podcasts. Well, it sounds like you've gone through sort of hell and, and heaven through this, if I may borrow some Soul Patrol terms. Oh. Um, what kind of advice can you give to people who are trying to make their own audio cinema? or audio theater? Well, I'm awfully jealous of those people who do um, five- or seven-minute-long comedy bits. Uh, they're so great, wonderful, easy, and I think that is so... Uh, if I had to redo this all over again, maybe I'd choose to do uh, something comedic and not drama. My shows have all this drama, they have all this adventure, and that takes all this time with sound effects and the right music and the right this and the right that. And then, like, I'll listen to some stupid, stupid thing that works so great. <laughs> and I go, why didn't I do that? <laughs> so I would say, hey, you know, keep it simple, keep it short. And if you can't make something work in, like, under five minutes, you shouldn't be in radio or TV. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Do you have any other projects that you have in the back of your head on, or on the go? Yes, there's a number of them. Um, there's an animated series, which um, I'm about to begin pitching again here around town, and there's a one-minute radio drama series, which is incredibly stupid, and um, I hope to uh, get to that sometime in 2006. I that think pretty much really guarantees success. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with us on the Sonic Society, David. We look forward to listening to the rest of Soul Patrol and more episodes to come. Thank you very much. All the best to you. And likewise, I hope everyone up north, the Great White North, enjoys my shows, visits the sites, and um, asks your local radio station for more episodes. Good Bye. night. My name is Jack Ward, and we're in the Sonic Society. Coming up from Dream Realm Enterprises, episode number five of Robots of the Company. Dream Realm Enterprises presents... Today in Robot News with your robotic news anchor, Fizz Gizzit. Hello, I'm Fizz Gizzit. Today in Robot News, nuts and bolts, you have them. This just in. It seems that the Titan One's adventures have not yet started. I have no idea why I'm on at the beginning of this episode instead of interrupting the middle. Let's go now to our roving reporter, Frag Meltdown, to get his assessment of the situation. Frag. Well, what can I say about such an event as this? But it seems that we have started before the opening credits. I have it on good authority that the writers simply have run out of ideas. Yes, they've run right out of ideas. Or was that mashed potatoes? 
Oh, well, perhaps they're merely out to lunch, or even popped by the store to buy supplies. Really, I just cannot be bothered to comment on such a thing. I feel I really have to stop you there, Frag. You don't really know your rear compartment from a hole in the ground now, do you? I really no longer have to put up with this abuse you give to me week after week, you know, you tin-headed trash compactor you. So I am out of here. I quit. You never cease to entertain me, Frag. Thank you. And in other news, it seems the show is now finally starting. And this just in, here comes the theme tune. Please don't kill me, make it snow. Oh, yeah, I'm a partner, don't you know? <laughs> Do you ever think maybe we've had one too many? <laughs> one too many what? That's the question. <laughs> Oh, oh, we gotta stop. <laughs> My positronic net is starting to hurt. Hey, come on, guys, ad lib. Help me out some. Hey, it's the writer. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Writer person. Hey, so what's happening here, guys? You don't know? I thought you were the great and brilliant creator. Now you're asking us what's going on? Well, I was kind of hoping you might help me out for a change. Look, Buster. We're just characters in a stupid audio play about robots. I mean, I ask you, robots? What are you, brain dead? Out of ideas, quill boy? Oh, I've got plenty of ideas. How about this one? Today in Robot News with your robotic news anchor, Fizz Gizzit. Hello, once again, I'm Fizz Gizzit. Today in Robot News... This just in, the creators of Robots of the Company have just announced that the Expositron robot, the bot created to narrate each episode, has just come down with a deadly metal virus. This virus is so potent that it eats away the outer casing of its robot host within seconds, soon followed by the bot's inner workings. Oh my, how truly awful. The affected robot has been reported as saying, quote, help, I'm melting. What a surprising development that is. This has been a robot news update with your robotic news anchor, Fizz Gizzit. More news when we think of some. Now that's just not fair. You should have thought about that before. Well, I guess this is our swan song. Would you stop referring to yourself as our? As I've told you before, we are one robot. Not two. <laughs> oh dear, exactly one half of my body has just melted away. Help! Help! I don't want to die! I'll, I'll add lib! I'll add lib! You sure? I promise, Daddy, I promise. Okay, you can live. But only this personality. But it'll be lonely in my head. Tough. It's either going solo or going melties. Your choice. Solo it is. Okay. Then do your job. <clears throat> Announce. Oh, 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 right. Yeah, um, uh, this week's episode, not a plot going on here. So, why is everyone being so quiet today, huh? Ah, uh, we're just bored, Sphinx. Not much to do these days, now that the crew are all dead. <laughs> The crew are dead? When did that happen? Back during the season premiere. Don't you remember? The season premiere of what? The season premiere of this show, you little idiot. Hey, hey, chill out, GD. Cut the little guy some slack. Yes. Briscoe just lost his cousin. He's still all heartbroken. What? Yeah, see what I mean? Idiots. <laughs> Hey, garbage disposal. Can I clean anything for you today? Yeah, yeah, sure, kid. Just stick your appendage right down my nozzle. No! Don't do it, Briscoe, my boy. He's trying to trick you. Oh, you guys. I'm sure he'd never do that. Would you, Dee Dee? Oh, no, never. See? Hey, boys. What's happening?
Hi, Squeak. <laughs> Can I clean anything for you today? No, thanks, sugar. Just came in to see if I could find something to do. Seems Shinwap is avoiding me for some reason. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear that girl just doesn't like me. Oh, I'm sure that's not the case. We all like you, Squeak. Especially now that you've, um, <clears throat> changed. I'll say. Why don't you come over here, baby doll? I have a job or two you can do. Let me warm you up with my heating element. You are all pathetic. Stick a sock in it, Excelsior. I will conquer your society and destroy without mercy. Just try it, no knobs. Boys, boys! You embarrass me when you fight over me. I know I've changed, and maybe for the better. But I'm just a little harmless go-bot after all. No need to make foes. <laughs> just promise us you'll never change back. I second that notion. Me too. Woo-hoo! Not to worry. I'm never going to change again. Except maybe my voice. You like my accent this week? I'm a regular Southern Belle. I don't mind what accent you choose. Your voice is sultry enough to melt the rust off a radiator. All right, what's going on in here? Not much. Nothing. Not a thing. I will vaporize the known universe. Okay, then. Lights out. It's past work hours. We're shutting down for a while for light speed travel. What? But the crew are dead. Why bother? Butch and I have decided, despite no crew, no purpose, and no plot, we're heading back home to complete this mission anyway. Uh-huh. Eh? What? You heard me. We're getting this bucket of bolts underway again. So, anyone who doesn't like it can kiss my metal posterior. Got it? You bet. Oh, yeah. No problem. You will all kneel before the might of Excelsior. And so comes to an end another incredibly unintelligible episode of Robots of the Company. Honestly, I have no idea why you guys still show up for this junk. I could think of at least a thousand other things I'd rather do than listen to something like this. Oh, uh, like have my head riveted? Um, eat termite-infested camphor wood? Hmm, staple my own hand to a desk somewhere damp and musty. Boy, this is lonely inside my head now. I think I'm going to go find myself a corner to hide in and cry for a while. In the meantime, please enjoy the sanity of your normal, everyday lives. Robots of the Company, episode number 203. Not a plot going on here. Written by Jonathan Patrick Russell. Starred in order of appearance. Fizz Gizzit and Frag Meltdown, Jonathan Patrick Russell. Expositron 1, Jim Barber. Expositron 2, Ellie Hirschman. Writer, Jonathan Patrick Russell. Sphinx, Jim Barber. Popsicle, Daryl Looney. Frisco, Kyle Bors. Zentron, Jeff Niles. GD, Ellie Hirschman. Squeak, Sally Wyatt. Excelsior, Ted Gray. Shinwipe, Kay Wu. Creditor, Jonathan Patrick Russell. The title theme was written and composed by Daryl Looney. The incidental music was provided by Daryl Looney with additional material by Firstcom. The associate producer was Kay Wu. The post-production editor, script editor, executive producer, and director was Jonathan Patrick Russell. The series, Robots of the Company, is copyright 2005, Dream Realm Enterprises, all rights reserved. Any rebroadcast or reproduction of this program without the express written permission of Dream Realm Enterprises is strictly prohibited. Thank you for listening. We invite you to visit us on the web at dregold.com or dream-starproductions.com. For more information, please email us at darkbuilding1 at yahoo.com. Although nothing really went on during the making of or telling of this audiogram, we hope you listened anyway. Thank you for whatever. Be sure to join us here next time for a very special episode entitled The Dr. Philbot Show. And that's this week's show. Thanks so much for participating in the Sonic Society. Be here next week as darkness falls and the undead rise again in Sound Mind Theater's The Curse of Dracula. Join us, won't you? The Sonic Society was produced and directed weekly by Andrew Dorfman and Jack Ward. Theme music by Sharon B. The Society originates from CKDU in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, which can be found on the web at www.ckdu.ca and is also rebroadcast through affiliated stations around Canada and the United States of America. 
Look for upcoming episodes and schedules for the Sonic Society through our website at www.sonicsociety.org. See you next week at this same time in the Society. Until then, I'm Jack Ward.